Gods. Since the beginning of time, mankind has worshipped these powerful and distant beings. In its eagerness to find logic and understanding for the world around it, the human race has consecrated its faith to thousands and thousands of deities all over the planet. From the powerful, haughty and imperfect humanized gods of ancient Greece and the Aegean Islands, who, although immortal, lived as men, judging and abusing their strength from the top of the great Mount Olympus, to the merciless and sinister gods of the Mesoamerican tribes and communities. Cruel and insatiable gods that fed on rivers of scarlet to maintain the eternity of their lives in the universe. Thousands of different peoples have worshipped thousands of different gods, and the Vikings, a people of fierce and hard warriors coming from the icy and merciless lands of Scandinavia, where winter is cruel and hard even for the wolf. Summers are as short as smiles, and the earth is meant to give its fruit rendered devotion to a pantheon of immortal warriors related to an ancient god who created the world with the bones, blood and the brains of the first of the giants. A universe born of fire and ice, where nine ancestral worlds are nestled in the trunk of the largest of the existing trees, and where two castes of immortals were engaged in war. Adored by a people where death among the horror, the blood and the violence of war was the ultimate desire of men. Where the father of all observes existence from his throne in Asgard, through the shrewd gaze of two ravens where thunder roars to the sound of the hammer and ferocious frozen giants sleep among peaks strewn with ice and snow. It was in this world that the most fearsome and dreadful deity was born. A quasi-ghostly apparition of death, pestilence, disease and horror, embodying for herself all the tragedy and despair of a death without honour and glory. Born of the mixed blood of an immortal and a giantess, sister of two of the most monstrous beings of any mythology, condemned to bring an end of everything. With all the sweetness, loveliness and beauty that women crave for themselves on the right, and with the rottenness, decay and stench of the fatal destiny from which all men and women flee, rises Hela, goddess of death, disease and pestilence, sovereign of the dead without honour, womb of misfortune and sovereign of the throne of Helheim. The world tree Yggdrasil united the nine worlds into one, connecting them by a path of shining rainbows where only the gods can walk without perishing. Nine worlds united and distant from each other. The depths of Niflheim, cradle of the eternal darkness that existed before all else. Jotunheim, Home of the cruel giants of ice and frost, the Jotun. Asgard, abode of the Asir gods, deities of war, valor and men, where the throne of Odin resides, father of all. Vanaheim, home of the Vanir gods, deities of nature and magic. The land of mortal men, Midgard. Alfheim, home of the beautiful light elves. Nidavellir, also called Zarvelfheim, abode of the Shadow Elves. The fiery hell of Muspelheim, burning like a thousand volcanoes, and the worst of all of these worlds. Hidden in the deepest depths of Niflheim's eternal blackness, at the roots of the world tree, among rivers of mud and broken swords, valleys of poison and sight of a fortress of misery, horror and disgust. Helheim, kingdom of the dishonored dead, all servants of Hela's hosts, the rejected goddess of the Norse pantheon. The Vikings never feared death. Fierce and wild as fiery balls, they threw themselves into combat in a fit of recklessness that seemed to disregard their lives. Undaunted and serene in the face of death, almost wishing to meet it in the fury of combat and the edge of a sword against their body. And who could fear this death? If death surprised you in battle, you would be rewarded with the entrance to Valhalla, the great hall of the fallen where the god Odin, king of the gods of Asgard, awaited you 
in an eternal banquet full of mead, juicy meats, women, combat, and eternal pleasures. Eternal honour and glory would be the reward for all who fell in valiant combat. But death would not be the same for all. When a man survives all his battles and old age knocks at his door, bringing the aches and pains of age, when sickness knocks him down, he perishes by murder or has lived a life of vileness and treachery. The dreadful realm of Helheim awaits him, the most horrifying and deepest of the nine worlds. An abyss of terror and darkness hidden deep in the roots of the tree world, Yggdrasil. The way of Helway path that leads to the gates of the fortress of the goddess Hela is the most horrible place in existence, a place that binds the souls of the damned with chains that not even the sledgehammer of the mighty god Thor can break. With anguish and despair lacerating the heart of the soul, chained forever in its pits, and the handmaids of the rotten and beautiful goddess inviting you to pass into what will be your home until the end of time. A maze of mist, darkness and blackness envelops the eyes of the damned as the gnawed and unbreakable hinges of Hellgate's door open, welcoming the soul of the dead. The sun fades from the eyes and disappears as a faint point of light he will never see again. The fortress of the half-dead goddess is called Eliot, the Misery, a palace of black, sinuous shadows that crawl over one another shaping massive towers that are lost in the black, cloud-ridden skies of Helheim. The moans and sobs of the damned souls mingle with the guttural shrieks of the wind, the wailing, the laughter of the vile souls for whom even the torment of Helheim is no punishment. But nothing sounds behind the walls of Eliot's fortress like the panting and howling of the great dog Garm, huge, massive and dark as the soul of a traitor. Red-eyed and bloodthirsty, huge paws bigger than a bear's and a coat thick, black and dirty with mud and poison. The watchdog of the dead goddess is huge like no other beast, with long white fans as sharp as swords, jaws full of rot and saliva, and a chest red and bloody as a battlefield. The hall of the goddess's palace was called Vilkanda, offering a dreadful dark scene full of sinking mist and walls crawling with poisonous snakes. The sun never shines in Helheim, from where not even the gods can leave without the consent of the Lady of the Dead, since the great river Kajal, fierce as an ever-hungry beast, impassable even for the best of navigators, and full of lethal poison instead of water, prevents escape. And it is there, after the dreadful procession of arrival and at the eternal abode of the damned and honourless souls, that you have your first audience with the goddess. Seated serene and undaunted on her throne of decay, bones and souls pressed one against the other. On her right side there could be no more beautiful apparition. Her skin is soft and smooth as a cloud, tender, shining and rosy as a baby's the owner of a beauty that melts the heart and is a slight yet remarkable consolation to the agony of the journey. Her eyes green and full of life, her hair silky and shiny, her lips red, plump and appetising as juicy berries. There is no woman more beautiful than the right side of the goddess, ruler of Helheim. But on her other side, on her left, is the most frightful image the eyes are capable of resisting. Her flesh is black, purple and swollen, with white crests crawling among the dead and festering tissue. Her hair is a pair of withered, rangy locks. Her mouth is contrite and dry, with what must have been her lips pulled back in a ghastly tableau showing old, scabby teeth. There is no greenery or life in her other eye, Dead, putrid, and strabic. It seems to look at everything, and at the same time not pay attention to anything without looking in any direction. Her right hand is precious, alive and fleshy, like a caress or a kiss, while her left hand is starved and withered, with aging flesh on its bones. 
Hella was born of a forbidden love affair, a secret relationship from which the end of time would be born. Loki, god of deceit, cunning and ingenuity, the most crafty, vile and artful of the immortals of Asgard, conceived her with Angriboda, the attractive giantess of ice that the artful god had as a lover, since his wife was the goddess Sigyn. And from this union, three sons were born. Jormungadr, a great serpent destined to perish by taking the life of the strongest among the gods and to fill with poison and venom all the seas of the land of men. Fenrir, a fierce wolf, bigger, stronger, and more deadly than any other, destined to snatch the life of the king of the gods and to swallow the moon and the sun in his jaws. And Hela, the goddess, beautiful on one side and rotten on the other, destined to rule over the dead and lead an army of shadows in the last of all great battles. Warned by a dream, the king of the gods sent for Loki's illegitimate children, confining each to a different abode. The great serpent Jormungadr would go to the sea, Fenrir would be chained, and Hela would be crowned as queen of the souls without glory, who would serve her until the end of all times and whom she would judge depending on their way of life. From her coronation, the bed of goddess Hela would be insomnia, clur. Hunger, meaning hunger, would be her table. Her knife, named Sultan, would be thirst itself, and the direction of all souls under her care would be under the administration of her two maids, Ganglate and Ganglera, one the decay, the other, Laziness. But Hela would not wait for the last great battle of Ragnarok in idleness. For although serious and frivolous, she had inherited something of the restless character of her artful and immortal father. Helheim is also the place of condemnation for all the impious and malevolent souls who enjoyed in life to spread pain and vileness throughout the world. A punishment from which not even a good death in battle could save them. The terrible hall of Nastrand, whose name means square of corpses, is where the souls of the vile people must end. Murderers, traitors, cowards, those who lie under oath and those who enjoy deceit. Nastrand is the darkest, blackest and most dreadful place in Helheim, where the sun never shines, never has shone and never will. Through its walls crawl thousands of poisonous snakes with eyes and snouts pointed inward, spitting rivers of poisonous venom that flows in torrents across the floor and evaporates in clouds of polluting and lethal gas. This hall of condemnation and torture where Loki's illegitimate daughter presides over the punishment of the most perverse souls is undoubtedly similar to the hell of the Christian tradition and it's not surprising that the name of the kingdom of the goddess of death is so similar to the English word hell, from which it originates. The legends tell that sometimes when she feels bored and fed up with the monotony of her dark kingdom, Hela leaves her place of darkness, and on the back of her sinister steed, Helhest, a bony and spectral horse, pale as a man before being lost in death, emaciated as a victim of the worst of diseases as well as lame in one leg. She rides through the nine worlds, leaving behind a disease, plague, misery, bad harvests, and sobs. Sometimes the goddess passes on the back of her steed, sweeping the earth with her broom, dragging whole peoples to their deaths without leaving a single survivor, while at other times she rakes the earth leaving some survivors as witnesses of her passage through the land of men, elves or giants. The legends say that after Balder, a god of music, light and beauty was killed by his brother Hod because of the malice and deceit of Loki, Odin sent Hermod, the swiftest of the gods, to Asgard on the back of Sleipnir, his eight-legged stallion and the fastest creature of all living things, to Helheim. In a desperate attempt to convince Hela to allow the return of Baldur to the world of the living, Hermod rode along an ever deepening and icy path, north of all worlds, 
and steadily descending. The eight legs of the horse of the father of all rode without pause or exhaustion for nine days and nights until his rider reached the threshold of Helheim and the fortress of Eliad, where the immortal son of Odin would enter under the watchful eye of the fierce dog Garm, who would pant anxiously and impatiently, awaiting the slightest sign of his mistress to attack. But the goddess, although she would receive Hermod, would not heed his request until she knew that all things wept and longed for Balder. Only then would she allow his return. Otherwise, the beautiful god Balder would join forever with the great people of goddess Hela. Hermod would travel the nine worlds, asking all beings to confirm that Balder was missed by all, and that all eyes had cried. But, about to achieve the mission, Hela would refuse to free the god of beauty and the sun from her kingdom of darkness, because the giant Thok, who would actually be her father Loki, liar and vile as he only can be, and disguised as a giant, would refuse to mourn for him, and the god Balder would remain forever locked up with a lady of the realm of the dead and the thousands of souls that accompany and assist her. And she would not free him until the end of time, in the last great battle where Hela would join her father and brothers to face the forces of Asgard and the gods. Ragnarok When the nine worlds meet their end and the foundations of the world tree shake until its trunk burns, Hela, like the rest of the immortal gods of Asgard and Vanaheim, will join the army that will fight in Ragnarok, the battle of the end of the world. It will be in the distant future, though no doubt closer with each day that the sun sinks below the horizon, after the age of the gods when only the guardian god Heimdall watches, for the rest of the gods will sleep. It will be in a long, cruel and dry winter, where the earth will freeze without bearing fruit and the crops will die without serving as food for anyone, a winter that will end without a spring, summer or autumn to follow. For another winter, even longer and worse will follow and another after that, and another. People will go hungry and in need. Brothers will fight and kill each other. Fathers will put their sons to the sword, and the sons will do the same to their fathers. Realm after realm will clash in war, filling entire fields with death that will only feed the ravens, and an unbearable stench will spread throughout Midgard. And then Hela, will trot across Midgard on the back of her starving horse, Helhest, turning whole fields into dry and dead fields, sharing with men her table of hunger, misery and thirst. The hearts of people will be filled with hatred. Millions will die, swelling the ranks of Helheim and Valhalla. So it shall be until the red cock of Helheim crows and Heimdall blows his horn, which will initiate the great battle of Ragnarok, where Odin, Thor, Tyre, Frey, and all the immortal gods will take up their weapons, put on their armor, and unite all in the last contest. The earth will tremble until the cliffs fall into the sea, and Loki is released from his prison and seeks his sons to join him in his vengeance against the gods. Fenrir will be released from his chains, greater than any other creature, greater than the sun and the moon which he will engulf in his jaws before the father of all finally dies between his enormous jaws. Your Mungadu will come out overflowing the seas upon the land, looming only his head and less than half of his body and poisoning the waters with his venom. The gods of Asgard will go into battle in the company of thousands of honourable and brave warriors who have ended up in Valhalla, ready to fight one last time. And the goddess Hela owner of the largest army that never was and never will be, made up of all the souls who have died of old age, disease, murder. And even those unworthy warriors without honour will take sides in the war of the end of the worlds with his father and his brothers. Garm, Hela's hungry and loyal guard dog, will follow her into battle, breaking the roar of the thousands of Odin soldiers with the howls of his murderous jaws he will confront the god of war, Tyr, with a fight that will culminate in the death of both. Nidhogg, the great corpse-eating dragon that gnaws at the roots of the world tree, will also join her in this great battle, 
but nothing will strike terror into the minds and the hearts of her enemies than the arrival of Hela on the battlefield, the great plain of Vigrid. She will arrive in silence without making a sound with her mouth uttering a word or making more of a show than the asymmetrical shuffle and movement of her steed Helhest. With a haze of pestilence, tragedy and disgrace following the three hooves of her ghostly horse, with half of her clothes and armour as perfect, shining and polished as the full moon or the sun, resembling on one side those of a king, while on her left they look like those of a beggar, with rotten and nicked fabrics, metals dyed in rust and poverty. With half of her body made up, perfumed and precious as a maiden on her wedding day, and the other as dead, neglected and corrupt with flowers and jewels on her right and the stench of death, white maggots and the clouds of flies on the left, with the serene, cold and unperturbed expression of always before pulling the bony bridles of her horse. But although silent on her own, it will not necessarily be silence that will follow in Hella's footsteps, for millions of feet will follow her to the doomed plain of Vigrid, billions of the doomed and peaceless dead making the earth tremble as they follow bringing with them an uproarious storm of moans and howls that will drown out any sound other than the growls of her god Garm and the howls of her brother Frenrir. It will be an accursed day when Hela will surrender her armies to her father Loki, and millions of the dead will join Loki's hordes, with fierce frost-roasted giants of Jotunheim, the fire giants of the infernal Muspelheim. The armies of Helheim will face the brave troops of Valhalla in an excruciating and thrilling battle that will culminate in a field completely filled with corpses that will meet their final death, disappearing forever, while Hela, the only daughter of Loki, queen of Helheim, and ruling goddess of the dead, will smile with half of her mouth. Nothing will be left after this battle, only a couple of gods. A world turned to ashes, corpses of mortals and immortals spilled in blood and mud and the distant gaze of Hela, who will return to the bottom of Niflheim, to the deepest point of the world tree, to the then empty kingdom of Helheim, where she will wait for the new souls that will fill it when the world is reborn and rises from its ashes. Death has long been the greatest fear of mankind. In all cultures, it is associated with darkness, decay, and terror. Hela is not the only frightening deity of death that the human mind has come to conceive. From the haughty Egyptian god Zanibus with the head of a jackal, the resurrected Osiris, or the sinister Sumerian lady of death, Ereshkigal. But perhaps there is no more unpleasant and macabre being to receive us in the other world than the putrefying and sinister Hela. Norse myths have no shortage of fateful and bitter beings, from the bloodthirsty Jotun to the stinking Draugr undead, who haunt the tombs for their stinking heavy corpses. The cold lands of Scandinavia conceived many terrifying monsters. If you really want to meet them and find out more about them, let me know in the comments. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I know there is a ton of content out there, and I'm sincerely appreciative for you watching this right through to the end. If you enjoyed it, please go ahead and hit the like button. And if you don't already, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and select the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future uploads. Also, please leave a comment on this video let me know what you thought of it. Comments really help with the YouTube algorithm and will really help my channel to grow. You can also let me know what type of videos you would like to see more of on this channel. That really helps me branch out into new subject matters. If you have a story you would like me to tell on this channel, please email it to me at stories at daredevril.com. If you want to support my channel even further, there are a number of ways you can do so. You can buy me a coffee via my coffee account, or simply help me out by sharing my content with anyone you might think is interested in watching it. Thanks again.